When Alaskans created the Permanent Fund, it was a grand experiment. Other oil provinces had tried to preserve some of their wealth for future generations. Few, if any, had succeeded. Money, it's a gas. Grab that cash with both hands and make a stash. Nine years after statehood, the oil strike at Prudhoe Bay in 1968 ushered in a new era of prosperity for the 49th state. But while the state treasury received $900 million in lease bonuses the next year, the money was quickly spent, and Alaskans worried that more oil wealth would slip through their fingers. They became determined to cushion the boom and bust cycle that had plagued states and countries with natural resource wealth. For several years, legislators and residents debated what to do with the pending windfall. Eventually, they settled on a long-term savings account, an idea first put into legislation by Governor Keith Miller in 1970. Voters in 1976 decided on a constitutional amendment to set aside 25 percent of royalty and lease income from the oil fields. Today, the question is whether fund income can be used for government. As budget reserves shrink, the day of reckoning approaches on the state fiscal gap, and policymakers are revisiting the circumstances surrounding the creation of the permanent fund. Perhaps no other part of state government has undergone as much scrutiny. The investment policies gradually have been liberalized over the years, growing the fund to $25 billion and beyond, exceeding the dreams of its founders. The dividend program established in 1982 has given every resident a share of the oil wealth. But the dividend also has made for complicated discussions about the state's tax structure and about the civic obligations of Alaskans. Money. Get back I'm on right, yeah. Keep your hands off of my stack And as 2003 came to a close, there were competing proposals for constitutional amendments to change the structure of the fund or the dividend. If there's any consensus, it's that Alaska, due to the foresight of a generation of political leaders, has built itself an asset that is the envy of other states. Then came that portion of the debate, which I call the hard-fought debates, from 77 to 1980. The debate centered on the differing objectives and potential management structures for the permanent fund. Ultimately, the question, the larger question, was whether or not the permanent fund could be both permanent and all things to all people. The debate then was, is it going to be a savings account uh, or is it going to be a development bank? Are you going to use the money that the fund generates to, uh, uh, to subsidize business and to subsidize individuals or are you going to try to save the money and treat the fund as a, uh, as a public trust? It's sort of like abortion. There's really no room for compromise. It's either a savings trust or it's a development bank. I think there's a different, uh, different tradition uh, in Canada vis-a-vis -vis the United States. I think the United States is much more individualistic and, and therefore much more entrepreneurial so that it's more a situation of people uh, looking after their own affairs and making their own decisions and what can't be done then is done by government. In Canada it's kind of the other way around where government tends to take things over and and leave only to individuals what government decides it can't do very well. That's reflected in the comparison between the Alberta Heritage Fund and the Alaska Permanent Fund. It's interesting that there is so little similarity between Alaska and Alberta once it got started. It was the same era, 1976, and it was the same source of revenues, although almost exclusively oil in Alaska oil and natural gas in Alberta and from there on there was a there was a divergence. 
The fund is a success because it's constitutionally created. You cannot, legislature can't come in and say they don't want the permanent fund anymore. It's, uh, it can only be, uh, the principal can only be spent by a, a vote of the people saying that they can do it. So it's got that kind of protection that Alberta doesn't have and that many of the other funds around the, the world don't have. So it was very easy to reverse, and unfortunately that happened. And to a, a very a major extent, a lot of money was frittered away that could still be there. Kuwait and Alberta were the um, two areas that had formed banks roughly at the same time, but quite different uh, development. It seems to me there was a lot of discussion about them yes, at that time. Right. Yeah. And, and we chose more the Kuwait model, uh, and the development bank was Alberta. And, and uh, you know, you look at what they've got there versus what we've got here, the record speaks for itself. And they had divided it into infrastructure grants and allocated a huge portion of that fund to government paper. So rather investing in the capital markets of the world, they were investing in their own government paper. There they gave them an impossible task because they charged them not only with managing the fund, but also with uh, social responsibilities, with development responsibilities, uh, with um, responsibilities that had to do with the uh, care of their people. And I think in great wisdom, our uh, legislature and our governor at that time when they formulated the principles, that they didn't mix it up. What a reason for waiting and dreaming of dreams. People simply voted on a constitutional amendment and all of us here as voters did the same. And there wasn't a lot of great detail as to what the intent was. So we tried to find out what people's intent was and certainly people might change their minds from time to time. But there was uh, several things that people kept saying they wanted done. One, they wanted to save the money and, and not have it frittered away. One, another one was that they wanted to invest in renewable resources. And another one was that they did want to diversify and stabilize the Alaskan economy. So we looked at how could we do all of those things. And one conclusion we came to was that you, it was probably a bad idea to try to accomplish all of those goals through one vehicle. We had a generation of giants in the House, and actually we had giants in the Senate too. And I'm not going to talk about more recent legislatures, but then we had a generation of giants. And, uh, but we had an impasse. There was this disagreement. There were 10 solid votes in the Senate for three years about the development bank, and nothing was going to happen. And so in the interim, the commissioner of revenue holding the, the treasurer's hat for the state got to manage the permanent fund. So the first official uh, to run the permanent fund was Sterling Gallagher. This could have been a development bank. And what is a development bank? Well, historically, the track record shows that's the lender of last resort. After all the real banks have turned you down, you go to the government's development bank. And so what you end up is a portfolio is a portfolio of non-performing loans. If you attempt to use it as an Alaskan development fund, now, if you, if you do the latter, uh, then I think it's almost as though you didn't have a permanent fund. You might as well consider it part of the general fund. I mean, you couldn't spend the principal. So even if you had goofy ideas, you couldn't touch that money. Remember, in the early days, it was mostly principal. hadn't built up this huge earnings reserve as it did later in, in the 90s. We provide for a, a feasible project uh, to be funded up to a half a million dollars per individual that's involved. One Alaskan's got an idea, he requires a half a million dollars of funding, he would qualify under our plan to receive that funding. One of the things that I think that was learned in the House through the activities of the House Special Committee on the Permanent Fund is that uh, you can't create uh, financial feasibility uh, in, in these different uh, say resource industries simply by dumping money into them you, know, you can't dump some money in and expect it to take off permanent funds not a panacea and I think it would really be a mistake for us to take the permanent fund and say well this is the thing that's going to ignite the economy of this state the bill proposes that the permanent fund be established as an investment function of state government that the monies that are in that fund 
uh, not be aimed at other purposes that uh, may be valid ones for state gov government to accomplish, such as financing economic development uh, within the state of Alaska, but be treated as an investment account. And there was a view that by st strictly setting these market standards and, and not giving preference to Alaska investments and to development loans and investments in the state, that we were exporting capital. History has proven just the opposite. The permanent fund has, in fact, turned into a great importing mechanism by mining, if you will, the capital uh, improvements and the investments that are in the global economy. In 1980, uh, the decision that was made was, was to establish the, the Permanent Fund Corporation. The Permanent Fund itself was uh, to be invested only in bonds or, or in mortgages. So the first thing that happened, I was nominated for the chairmanship. I immediately declined and nominated the Elmer Rasmussen. I had several reasons for doing this. It was one of the smartest things I ever did. Can you imagine me being chairman of a board with Elmer Rasmussen? <laughs> <laughs> Elmer was the one who could get up before the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce as he could. He said, no, we're not going to invest in Alaska. You set up a program for that. We, if we did that, we would not be diversified. When you needed the money, we'd be broke too. I could never have said that. <laughs> Elmer did that and he got away with it. And in those days it was all in bonds. So we've got the money in, uh, invested safely. Now what are we going to do with the income that is producing that's going into this, uh, that days, in those days it was the undistributed income account. Nowadays it's the earnings reserve account. Uh, and in those days the money all went uh, to government in the first couple of years, in 1980 and 81. In December of 1982, uh, Dave Rose was hired as the first executive director of the Permit Fund Corporation and then he spent the next few months creating the staff and the independent organization. I walked into an environment that was not only something unique in government, government saving or trying to meet the needs of future generations by saving some of the revenue now, but it was unique in what the environment that Dave Rose uh, created, which was a lot of people that were really committed to the successful management of the fund uh, and, a, and a collegiality uh, that would be virtually impossible to replicate. During the period of time that as a trustee we were building the fund and not just growing the corpus and, and the dollars but building the actual organization, hiring a David Rose, bringing in the uh, investment officers, that uh, it was very much hands off uh, by uh, the legislature and the administration. Uh, and this in a state where all politics is personal. And David Rose, the executive director, while well, he was not a trustee, he was an acknowledged expert in fiscal affairs and, and was a very strong executive director, um, believed that we should invest to the standards of a trust. Well, they call them the trustees. Uh, it's they're, they're entrusted with the care of the, uh, of the people's money. And uh, they've been doing it uh, with a terrific track record for two and a half decades. It was 25 years ago today that the state received its first uh, royalty payment that was deposited in the permanent fund. I was the person who physically took the check to the bank and deposited the money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget, it was drawn on the First National Bank of North Dakota, which meant that it, would, <laughs> it was from an oil company, naturally, and, and uh, it would take about 10 days to clear. But nevertheless, I credited the fund with its first deposit on February 28th. Now it's $25 billion, so it's uh, been a clear record of success ever since. The elements that make the permanent fund what it is today, I think, are the dividend and inflation proofing and the investment policy. But those things were all fought every step of the way. There were those who wanted to, when they, they it was created over their objection, and they immediately wanted it to become a, a loan program. Of course, if it had been a loan program when the economy had went south in uh, the mid-80s, the value of the permanent fund would have been cut in half. Now the fund has been very well managed and I commend those managers and it must continue to be so. But the fact is that Alaska is a state that has always been marked by a shortage of private investment capital. Now soon the permanent fund 
board may, and I, I, I hope uh, this becomes a reality, may be called upon to decide whether an equity investment in construction of a gas line to market Alaska's royalty gas will pay dividends to all Alaskans and will be marginally um, risky from the standpoint of the, the risk being minimal. Wouldn't be appropriate if we didn't talk about the permanent fund, but I've got a surprise. The $23 billion of our permanent fund has is, is, really become our state's greatest source of revenue. I propose that we work together to take a fresh look at our permanent fund. In addition to evaluating proposals for fundamental change, I think there are some other things that we can do right now. I'm going to ask the boards, uh, our board to see to it that we have a dialogue with the major national and international companies in which Alaska's permanent fund invests millions of dollars. I'd like to hear their ideas on how they can help create jobs here in Alaska. While well, we want the permanent fund to make good, sound investments, there's no reason why we shouldn't direct attention to those companies willing to provide jobs and invest here in Alaska. I've sensed a number of people in the room, not exactly cringe, but just a wave of uncertainty flow over people by what the heck did he really mean by what he just said. When you talk about the relationship between the permanent fund and the companies that it invests in, if you're simply going to these large corporations and saying, please, we'd like you to put an office here, that's one thing. But if you're predicating an investment decision on what their answer is, if you're threatening them, then it raises a, a, a number of questions about um, how we are actually making our investment decisions. If we're looking for support from a senator in... Um well, let's say Illinois, Fitzgerald is an example, on an ANWR vote, and we can justify that we put, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, $1.2 billion in Boeing stock, and Boeing is now headquartered in Illinois rather than Seattle, which is factual, that we could compliment uh, Boeing on uh, their management and indicate that we were voting our proxies for the Boeing management but we'd like to have the Boeing lobbyists help us out a little bit on ANWR. I don't think that's inappropriate. Well, I think hopefully we've got clarification that the governor didn't intend that to suggest that there was any change or movement away from the prudent man investor rule, that the, the trustees still make their decision on the return, the generating return, balancing the risk. If you look at the percentage of ownership of the company, um, it very frequently is a tenth of a percent maybe uh, two-tenths of a percent. So what that does is uh, it does open the door to the company, but it doesn't mean that the company is going to immediately turn right around and open a factory in Alaska. The governor has not given us any other direction uh, other than what he stated in his speech. Uh, I viewed it as, uh, as much a challenge for the trustees and staff to find opportunities uh, as much as anything, but we will uh, continue to look for investment opportunities, but it will be following the prudent investor rule. This is not government's fund. This is the people's fund. It has been managed as the people's fund since its inception, and that is why it's been so successful. Sooner or later, your legs get where you hit the ground. Serve it for later, don't run away, don't let me down. Sooner or later, you hit the deck, you get found out. Save it for later, don't run away, don't run away, don't let me down.